Welcome back to Golden Rule Radio, your weekly recap of the precious metals, uh, the markets that are closely associated. Days like today are certainly fun to be doing a program like this. Unfortunately, we don't have Rob Miles, but I do want to quickly just recap what the metals have done this week alone. Gold, we're sitting right now at $2,301 as we record. And since last week's recording, uh, that's up 5.7%. So we're recording on Wednesday, April 3rd. Uh, Silver is at $27.14. That's up 11% from last week. Platinum, $9.45, which is up 7.3% in a week. And then palladium, $1,042 as we record, up 8.6%. All of that in a slightly declining dollar index of 104.24. So, Miles, if you can't have fun showing us charts today, you might want to find another line of work. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah, the charts are fun today. Before I jump into them, though, Tori, because I know you've got this prepared also, it is a new quarter. So how are the metals looking over first quarter? How do we finish up? Great question. So similar performance. I mean, as we get into the end of the quarter, it's always nice to have a little bit of color there and positive territory and positive territory indeed because gold went up 8.1 percent in the quarter not quite as good as some of silver's performance in the last seven days but still to end up a quarter up eight percent is good silver finished the quarter up 4.3 percent so despite silver hitting a low in february of right around 21 dollars and 90 cents and now being up 23 percent from that low it still closed the quarter up 4.3% because of that initial decline, and it's taken a while to recover from that. Platinum and palladium finished the quarter down, and that's a continuation of prior quarters. Platinum was down 8.4% for the quarter, palladium down 7.6% for the quarter. And what I'm most intrigued about with this week's price movement is it's almost as if the white metals have come to life and are starting to be more indicative of maybe a broad-based commodity catch-up rally across the board. But hopefully that helps you kind of wrap up the week and an exciting quarter. Absolutely. Now let's dig a little bit into what we think we may see here over the next few weeks, because I was talking to a client earlier today, and uh, I kind of have a running joke. Anybody who tells you what the market's going to do is either lying or wrong. So it's obviously divination isn't our special suit, but there is the concept of pattern recognition. And I think we're going to talk about that here in a little bit when we talk about silver. But I do want to start with gold because gold, despite the fact that silver is currently outperforming gold on a percentage basis, it's still lagging behind nominally. So I do want to start with gold only because that's what people I think are looking at today. And then we're going to start explaining why we think you should definitely also be looking at silver here in a minute. So looking at gold, I've had a number stuck just pouring out of my mouth for two years now, 2350. It's going to be 2350, somewhere in that range, give or take 20, 30 bucks up or down. But I've just had this based on extrapolating out where potential reversal levels could be. That takes me to the concept of around 2350. So let's just pretend I happen to be neither lying nor wrong, but just happen to be right on this one. So we'll find out here probably in the next couple weeks. So far, so good. So far, so good. Yeah. You haven't been wrong yet. I know. Well, the clock hasn't struck 12 yet. That's right. There so you go. we're not, yeah, it doesn't count if we haven't gotten there. Although, is anybody going to complain if I'm wrong? Because if I'm wrong, it just means gold's going higher on this move. Eh, I'm okay being wrong on this one. So I want to look at gold from two different time frames. I want to look at the short term move starting back in October. We were sitting down around 1820. So from 1820 up to around what I think is going to be somewhere in the 2350 range, you can see on the chart here, it lines up a couple places where we could have some nice reversals, corrections in this clear breakout bull market move. The first one is actually where this move started about two weeks ago down at around 2150. So your 382 fib, that puts your short-term 382 at around 2150, 50% line back at the previous high, about 2090, and your beautiful 618 all the way down at 2020. So we're getting to the point where really all of your solid reversal levels are now over $2,000. 
in the short term. Instead of us playing between 1800 and 2100, we're now getting to the point where the old highs are starting to become the new lows. So the longer term time frame, I mentioned there were two time frames. This goes back to the start of the bull market back in 2019, where we were at around 1270. And that's actually going to put your first massive reversal if we saw something like that down at around 1940, which I just don't see that happening. We've had so much up and down in that time period that I don't necessarily think at this point mid bull market your long-term Fibonacci retracement levels really matter much because we're looking at shorter timetables for the moves. So those are some of the numbers I'm looking at. I'd love to see us take a really nice, strong push up, scrape somewhere in where I think our next short-term ceiling is going to be, and then let gold just take a breather for a month. But, and tell me what you think, Tori, I think that might open the doorway for another metal to play a little catch up. There you go. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, not to ignore silver and its exciting week. I'm really excited about it for a few reasons. One, you've been pointing to this line in the sand, this resistance point to the upside of around $26, that if we were to close above that, you would be reluctantly having to admit it might actually be a little bullish. So <laughs> with the, with miles tending to be the perma bear in many instances, and we've all been numbed to silver's performance because it does break a lot of hearts. We get excited about it and it lets us down, but at some point it will narrow the gap. And we started this trend at around 92 to one on the gold to silver ratio. Today it's 85 to one. So that's a seven point downward move in the ratio from that low in February of this year. And again, this week is a representation. Yes, gold's up 5.7%. That's exciting. It's at an all time high. Silver's up 11%. So that outperformance is the trend that you're alluding to and that we're talking about. That if we can get that to continue and have that gold to silver ratio come back down towards the long term 50 year average of closer to 60 to 1, now you're talking about silver really adding a performance component to your precious metals portfolio. And that's why we diversify accordingly. And so yes, we closed above the 26. We record now at 27.15 as if it's like filling a gap. And I'm excited to see what you have to say today in terms of where we might see resistance here. But also from that low, like I said, it's up over 20%. So technically, wouldn't you say that silver's in a technical bull market? Well, it's short term, obviously. Short term. Oh, and long term, obviously because we've been in a bull market in silver since 2020. It's that frustrating intermediate term, you know, that like one or two year time frame. you know, in silver's case, we spent two, two and a half years kind of doing nothing. Like it felt like a lot, but it was a lot of tire spinning, uh, a lot of tire spinning up and a lot of tire spinning down. And I mean, 20% trading range up and down, but it didn't go anywhere. Frankly, we're still in the trading range nominally. We haven't gotten above that $30 high back in 2021. Right. We certainly haven't gone below the 18, 17, 90 low back in 2022. So we are still technically in the trading range. I know you're desperate for me to get optimistic and I promise no. you I'm getting there. Short term though, you still do need to see the price get above some previous price levels because you never know who's got standing orders sitting there waiting to take profits. With that being said, from taking a longer step back and looking at the whole silver picture, we had a shorter term ceiling of 26 was not just broken, but decimated over the last 24, 24 hours. hours, which is great. Yeah. I love seeing that type of aggressive push through the line. You want to like a fullback hitting the line in a football game. You want it to be quick. It's affirmed by your joke last week. We hit 25.98 when we were recording last Wednesday and we were dejected because it didn't quite get there. So it did show a very firm, consistent resistance point. And yep. so then to close above it and just now blow right through it, that's affirmation of the fact that it was an important level. Oh yeah. So there are two things I'm looking at here for silver to now do. The first one is we need to get above what I would call the shoulder from the last high, the last sort of attempt to go higher we put in back in June of 2021. We had three highs 
in 2020 and 2021, all trying to push us above 28, 29, 30, and it didn't happen, and we came all the way back down to 18. So the most recent right shoulder of that high back in June of 2021, that's sitting at about 2790. That's going to be the next stopping point. And there actually is a little symmetry with some correction levels with recent trading that you could see a pullback there. The next stopping point isn't the high. The next stopping point isn't that $29 or $30 high. It actually would be a little bit higher. It'd be more like $31 or $32. So I would argue somewhere either just under $28 or just over 32 is where we're gonna see silver start to hit its head a little bit, at least in the short term move, because you've gotta give markets the chance to blow off some steam. In silver's defense, it's up 22% since March. Right. It ain't joking around at this point. So for it to move up to even my first level, that's a 25% move in a month. My second level would be like a 40% move in maybe two months. So you've got to see a little bit of blowing off some steam here somewhere. Now, I would love to see, again, this is my predicting the future divination, but it's more like I just like to look at a pretty painting. So what I would love to see is we hit that first number, high 27, maybe up around 28. And we pull back and we just take a real hard bounce off this 26 level or maybe slightly below it. And maybe that takes place right when gold's taking a little bit of a pullback. And now all of a sudden that 85 ratio is 65 or 58. Yeah. So I'd love to see something like that play out where they start to kind of seesaw back and forth as they're both climbing leading into the election later this year. Well, you do have a few things that could turn each of the prices down. Certainly the running out of steam, if you will, there's a lot of tired silver investors that once they start getting into a break even or profitable territory, you may see some selling where they're fatigued and they're out, right? So that's certainly it. Futures market too. I mean, we've seen some pretty amazing 24 hour activity According to FINRA, the SLV, which is the iShares Silver Trust, off exchange short sale volume, which just shows the number of trades marked as short sales mm -hmm. in various trading venues, had yesterday like 12.6 million shares of shorts in silver. So you're also going to see some speculation to the downside that silver has worn so many people out, they're not going to believe it. So they're going to short the silver market and that's going to put downward pressure. I mean, what does that number yesterday mean to you? So here's what's crazy about that. And you sent me a tweet earlier today from someone, literally, I think you just said true question mark. <laughs> so <laughs> when you texted that to me, so I Trust went to, because I don't, yeah, I don't think he was on the FINRA website where he pulled the data or he had repackaged it to send it out in a tweet. So I did go pull the straight from FINRA.org and looking at SLV and I'm like, that looks like a pretty big number. How does that stack up? So I pulled the last 365 days off the FINRA website and I just sorted it by quantity size, short quantity size. And then I checked total contract quantity size. So in the last 365 days, the biggest or highest quantity or highest volume of short sale trades placed was yesterday. I think it was, what'd you say, 12, 12.2? 12 12.6. 12 uh, on the short side, 12.6. And then it was like 19.1 for total transactions, not just the short sale, but all positions. So that was yesterday. That was April 2nd. The second highest day in the last year was six point something on the short and then I think 11 on the total. So it was about 40 to 50%. So the number one day yesterday was twice the size of number two day. You know when number two day was? The 28th of March. So the two biggest days and number three day I think was last October. So the two highest trading days and number one being twice the size almost as number two have all happened in this existing market. So being somebody who can't do divination and doesn't know the future, all we can do is really start to look for patterns, right? Not just patterns in the charts or patterns in the math, but also patterns in human psychology. So you start thinking the question, short squeeze. Oh, absolutely. We've seen it before. 
it's, it doesn't take a lot, and Wall Street bets proved this a few years ago, it doesn't take a lot to blow up a market in something like, who was it, GameStop, or the silver market, which right. they came after as well. It doesn't take a lot of momentum to push something like that, and you have a short squeeze on the largest position by probably triplicate over the last year of short positions in the silver market all at the same time, you have a short squeeze on something like that. Silver doesn't stop at 32. Well, it's not just silver either. I mean, silver doesn't. First of all, to go back to the short squeeze, yes, if the physical demand really ramps up too and people taking delivery at these prices, they don't want to sell their silver. But if you get any type of activity that squeezes these shorts and they start losing, those losses start to become realized with time. If we can have continued strength in silver despite those shorts, that's very, very volatile, if you will. I mean, you could see 15, 20% moves in silver in just a matter of days. I mean, we've seen 11% in a week with these shorts. You could see that in one or two days if those shorts get unwound oh, yeah. because they get stuck on the wrong side of the trade. So again, silver has to double, a little less than double. It's got to go up 40% now to reach its all-time high. Gold is at its all-time high. Essentially, I know we're $50 away from where you think it might go. And so I'm going to ask you, though, the flip side here. It's fun to see where things might meet resistance to the upside. So going back to gold, where do you think gold could come back to if, let's say, we have a seasonal trend continuation where summer gets a cooling off, we have a technical ceiling hit, you know, where it's not just you, but algorithms and traders that feel like that could be a potential top. Where do we see gold retracing to for the sake of the listener, where either they do sell a little bit here and reposition where, or they add to ounces later where in gold? Sure. So again, we can't know for sure until we put in that technical top and start moving down. But again, using my assumed numbers, I'm probably a gold buyer at 2150. I'm a gold buyer at 2080. I'm a gold buyer at 2010. And I'm a big gold buyer at 1940. Okay. I, I would it. argue 1940 is probably on this move Barring any type of external catalyst, stock market crash, you know, something that ends up yanking the market down, like a 2008 market crash, I think 1940 is probably your technical low at this point. I okay. do not see us going back down to numbers prior to that. And please hear me. I'm not trying to be bearish or burst everybody's bubble, but what goes up oftentimes comes down at some point in healthy fashion. We get this stair-stepping. And we actually need it. It doesn't mean the bull market is over. It doesn't mean the trend has changed. It means that it's opportunity to ride the wave. It's like a new wave kind of coming through, still heading the same direction. Now, I'll tell you this, too. Gold has been doing this despite three major headwinds, okay? One being treasury yields have continued here recently to really spike, and gold has ignored that. Two is the U.S. dollar. The dollar index went from 102 to 105 in short order. Gold ignored that. And then third, you've got obviously the rate cuts and that discussion saying, well, we're not going to cut rates now. That should be bearish for gold. And it wasn't. And, and oil is showing the same thing. Oil has been moving lockstep with, with the treasury yields. And that's very inflationary. Okay, so inflation has continued to be hot. And gold is telling a couple of stories. I think it is predicting continued inflation, you know, higher costs for longer. It is predicting, to me, continued geopolitical tensions. It's predicting fear and unrest. So when confidence in society and political institutions erodes, the appeal of gold rises. People move out of dollars, out of investments, into that store of value. And I think that's what we're seeing. And the East is telling the story more than the West. They're the ones buying the gold. They're the ones telling us that they have far more concerns and uncertainty regarding geopolitics and the winds of war than we're talking about in the West. Or maybe they have more fiscal concerns than we're talking about in the West. 
but to me it's very predictive. So Miles, I'm going to ask you to show us the same thing on the silver side. If we happen to meet some resistance here at 28 in the short term, you said it might come down and, and 26 be the floor. Where do you see it maybe run in 32, 35, you said, then where might we pull back to? So one of the reasons why I like that 31 and change to 32 range uh, is because it kind of lines up some of the retracement levels back to some of the levels we're getting to now. Like that would put your 382 at that 28, you know, 27, 90, 28. That's going to put your 618 fib down at the previous high we've had at 26 that we've been trying to break above. So that's one of the reasons why I picked that number is it puts some of the numbers that have been important as ceilings, it turns them into being important numbers as floors. So either way, whether we get a bump at 27, 28, then we run up to 32, we get a bump at 32. I still like those numbers across the board. I like 26 because we just blew through it and it would make a really nice floor. I like 28 because it's kind of the last line of defense before we get above the 2020 and 2021 highs. Even though those are a little bit higher up at 30, those were interday highs, who cares? Those were futures market spikes at 10 a.m. It didn't sit there for three days. So that's kind of where I come up with my numbers down in the low 30s. I think something like that could happen very quick and very aggressively. And then we could see some type of retracement back off of that. But again, I don't, I just don't know why silver would go below 26. Okay. No, and I appreciate that. And, I, and that's actually very encouraging. And I don't know why gold would reverse here either, if not for technicals. Now, we laugh because I'm the why, all right? You're showing everybody the what. What are the numbers and maybe the where, but... Oh, you're one I of those guys. Why. Yeah, I'm like... Yeah. Why would it do that? What That's a waste analysis. of energy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's, it actually is a very good question. Yeah, I'm a how. How does this happen? And you're the why would this happen? Right. And I don't see it happening. Why would it come down? Okay. It would come down because of a more significant dollar rally. It would come down because okay. the stocks don't just roll over like they have this week, but they fall off of a cliff. We tend to see a flight into the U.S. dollar in general, and that can, it for a week or two, pull down the metals. You could certainly have them come out and say, you know what, we're going to not only not cut rates, we're going to aggressively raise rates because the real rate of return is still negative. Real inflation is between 8 and 11, depending on how you measure it. And you can go get 45 or 5% in a 10-year treasury type position, 4.33 technically. And that means you're still losing. Your dollars are still losing. That's a negative real rate of return environment, very bullish for gold. If that were to change, that would bring it down. And then you, know, you get heavy speculation to the short side. You could see central banks dump ounces. Again, none of these things really, I don't see playing out in the next two to three weeks, maybe not even the summer. Maybe we skip a summer lull this year because again, the biggest underlying component to me is the fear and geopolitical tension that's in the markets. And you could get a pacification or a stabilizing in conversations and discussions between entities. Again, there's no sign of that right now. So this could continue to go. And if it continues to go and the white metals continue on this trend, they will play catch up with gold. And for the sake of the show, we're going to forego platinum and palladium today. But I want to remind everybody, inflation too is still going the wrong direction. And central banks, though, are going to force themselves to cut rates merely to help fund government deficits and debt, like to try to decrease that debt service load because the spending in Washington's not changing anything. Miles, those are the whys. Those are the underlying fundamentals as to why it could continue why it could go down, and I lean towards the continuation until the news changes. Here's what scares me about everything you just listed there, though, Tori, is we have examples over the last couple of years where those events didn't negatively impact gold. Yeah. And that's what makes me nervous about that. Raise the interest rates. Well, we've seen gold go up on raised interest rates. Stock market continues up and continues a rally when it should go down. Well, guess what? So does gold. 
In fact, the only thing on that list you listed was the last thing you said, direct intervention, central bank dumping gold. But another central bank is going to buy it up. That's right. And guess what? You know, you mentioned China. Gold's at all-time highs. China, Japan, Australia, all over Europe, Great Britain. Gold is at all-time highs almost everywhere on the planet except for the United States. And anybody who doesn't think it isn't going to play catch-up, out of your mind. And I know gold is at all-time highs in terms of the U.S., but to a fraction of a percentage of what it's done in Europe, in Asia. It's a whole different ballgame over there. Or inflation-adjusted, Miles. Like, if we adjusted it yeah. for inflation, it would be much higher. And people think, oh, $3,000 gold, not in my lifetime. $4,000 no, gold, right. not in my lifetime. You know, $4,000 gold is only about a 68% increase from here. And you and I have said over and over again that these bull markets don't exhaust themselves until you've reached, you know, 300% increases. And that's nothing from here. Another 68 to 70% dollar figures sound big, but we're in the numbers now where you have to stop focusing on the number of dollars and start focusing on the percentages of the move. And that's just not beyond anybody's scope of reality that another 100% move in silver wouldn't surprise us one bit. Now we're back into a new high, another 60% move in gold. Now we're in $4,000 gold. And unfortunately, it's because those changes aren't coming. Congress isn't going to get tightening the belt with spending. The federal government's not going to spend less. They're going to continue in this trend of money printing through the central bank. And that is the biggest reason right there. China's showing it now. They're now stimulating. They're doing this treasury bond program for the first time in decades that they said they'd never do again. They have to stimulate. And it's not just us. It's everywhere. And it goes back to the war problem. I'm super concerned about conflict because these central banks and these sovereign entities are really in a corner where they can't change course. And yet they need lower rates. And yet inflation's keeping them in check because society's getting angry at the price of goods sold. So anyway, I know we're kind of a broken record, but I appreciate putting you on the spot, having you kind of pin down some numbers. I hope it's helpful for the listener. And yet I also hope that you are encouraged from those underlying fundamental standpoint of why things could keep continuing on this trajectory. So that's going to do it this week for Golden Rule Radio. As always, we appreciate you stopping by. If you liked what you heard, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell. Better yet, why not head on over to our website? You can find us at McElvaney.com. We're also on Twitter at ICA Gold and Facebook at McElvaney Financial. Better yet, why not give Tori, myself, or anybody here at McElvaney Precious Metals a call to discuss your personal portfolio? We can be reached at 800 525 9556. Thanks as always and have a great week. 